Tonight our guest is Betty Rivard. Betty has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and a fifth year in Education from the University of California at Berkeley. And both a Master of Arts in Education and a Master in Social Work from West Virginia University. In 1999, she retired from a 25-year career as a social worker and planner, planner for DHHR. Since then, her award-winning fine art landscape photographs have been widely exhibited. In 2004, she was given the West Virginia Fellowship in Photography by the West Virginia Division of Culture and History and the West Virginia Commission on the Arts. Her photographs of historic school buildings were featured in the 2005 West Virginia Historic Preservation Calendar, and her work has been published in Golden Seal and Wonderful West Virginia magazines. She has worked as per diem staff for the West Virginia State Legislature and is in her seventh year of producing the arts fairs for Festival Charleston. She currently is doing research for a new book of wartime photographs of the Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard in Baltimore. The draft title is When We All Work Together. She will take questions at the end of her presentation and she has some pictures for you to look at. Uh, some of you have already noticed those. And she also has some books uh, up here at the front, at the front of the, uh, uh, that are available for purchase. Please welcome Betty. Art and uh, Associated Press. 
the book was uh, supported by Carrie Mullen, who's the director of the WVD Press, which published the book. And a lot of the really nitty gritty work of uh, implementing the vision of the book was uh, done by Stan Seth, who's their production manager. Um, Mark Crabtree is a photographer in Morgantown who has researched a piece of this um, project related to Walker Evans. He's spent about 15 years on it, has done an amazing job, and was a great supporter for what I was doing. And uh, also John Lilly at Golden Seal and the various reviewers who uh, have responded to the book. Um, Carl Fleshauer from the Library of Congress did the foreword, and Dr. Jerry Bruce Thomas, who's a professor emeritus from Shepherdstown, um, Shepherd University, uh, basically condensed a book into an essay about the New Deal. And the Coal Heritage Highway Authority and the Point Pleasant River Museum have both sponsored many exhibits um, of some of the photographs with grants from the West Virginia Humanities Council. And then I have a special recognition I'd like to give to um, Virginia Gross, who's here, who helped me with the PowerPoint the other day. My I broke my computer, and I asked her father if I could borrow one, and uh, <coughs> Virginia graciously volunteered to help me put it together and just did things I didn't know we could do. <laughs> so it's way better for her contribution. Uh, I'd like to ask you all a few questions. Um, how many of you were born in West Virginia? And uh, how many of you were born before 1950? Um, did you read Life or Look magazine when you were growing up? Where we were born. <laughs> uh, this will help me with my presentation, but have you looked through the book? And uh, have you read my essay? Okay, Larry and Father O'Donnell, you might be a little bored with some of what I say, because <laughs> I decided to take some of that from the essay. And uh, one other question. Have you had to deal with negative perceptions of the state? And I'm going to tell you one really quick story about my aha moment about that. I was um, involved in registering with an institution in the Northeast, I won't say what it was, and um, the clerk was asking me for my, you know, name, address, phone number, and I gave my address, and she said, I don't have enough room here for West Virginia, can I just put down Virginia? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to talk about how and why the photographs were made. And there were um, basically four, um, and I, I think I misplaced my page for a minute. Anyway, there, there were four uh, reasons. One was to show the problems and needs. One was to show the solutions and what the government was doing to address the problems and needs. The third was to show everyday life. And the fourth was to show life on the home front once World War II started. And I plan to uh, give samples um, of the photographs by nine of the 10 photographers. And, and just as background, there were um, the number, there's different numbers given, but about 175 to 200,000 photographs taken across the country, uh, basically between 1935 and 1943. It was, they were under the auspice of uh, the same director of the project, Roy Stryker, and a number of different organizations within the government where the project moved. And, went from the Resettlement Administration to the Farm Security Administration to the Office of War Information. I've referred to it as the FSA project because it's sort of it was its longest home and it's, it makes it a little bit easier to refer to it that way. 
They um, actually starting in 1934, before Roy Stryker was hired and the project formally started, there were several photographers who came to West Virginia whose work was included in the files of the project. So that's why my dates are different. And I talk about 1934 to 1943. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit as we go through the photographs. There were 10 photographers who came here th during that period. And I'll also talk about them briefly as I go through. And they took over 1,600 pictures. Um, I narrowed that down to 150 for the book. I had help from a curator who was uh, working with me toward an art exhibit. That never happened, but the book happened. And uh, I'd still like to do the art exhibit if anyone's interested. But it was really great because she had a curatorial eye. And, um, and then I added about 50 photographs to sort of round out the story. So I'm going to. Um, is Randy still here? Can you, would you mind to, okay, we're where we can start and I just start clicking, so thank you. That's what I need to know. Um, I'm gonna start talking through the photographs and I've divided them out according to the categories I mentioned. And I'm, I'm started, so I just do this. So in the book, about a quarter, 20, 20 to 25% of the photographs address the problem images, depending on how you interpret that. Um, and I wanted to start with those to just sort of put them in context. Um, this photograph was taken in Charleston in uh, September of 1938 by Marion Post Walcott. And her caption said that the mother has TB, the father works for the WPA. And there's a series uh, of photographs that go along with this that show the mother with a younger child, a very desolate looking apartment, um, just a really sad situation. Uh, even though Mary Post Walcott came in 1938 and her charge was, she had just been hired and uh, she, she had worked actually for a, uh, the Philadelphia a paper in Philadelphia where she ended up doing society types of photography and she didn't feel like she was contributing the way she would like to um, the problems in the country and was able to, to get hired for the FSA project. Uh, she was on an orientation visit, she was on probation and she came to West Virginia for about two and a half weeks. Followed kind of generally in the footsteps of some of the people who had come before, but also went off on her own. And took um, several problem photographs, even though her charge at that point was to show how things were getting better. My guess is that, and this is only a guess, that, uh, that where she was coming from was, yes, things are getting better, but don't forget, we still have these problems. And here's an example of that. But we'll also see some of her other photographs that are more positive images. She also, um, I tried to find things in the various writings and oral histories where the photographers actually talked about their experiences in West Virginia. And there was a little, I was able to find some things here and there, and I put what I could in the book. Um, but at one point she said basically the people are much better in much better spirits than what I expected considering that there's still terrible health problems. Uh, this uh, photograph was taken in uh, Scott's Run in July 1935 by Walker Evans and the caption was the interior of Minor Shack. Mark Crabtree, who I mentioned earlier, is um, very focused on finding out who this little boy was. So if anyone knows, I can put you in touch with him. Um, he, he hasn't been able to find out. Um, Walker Evans was already a well-established photographer in uh, New York and had had uh, some works exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, which was still new in the early years. And he um, actually came here before Roy Stryker started the project and then went back 
went to DC and met with Roy Stryker and was interviewed and was hired by him. And then his photographs were grandfathered into the project. Uh, this photograph was taken a little bit later. It was at Freeze Fork in Logan County in October of 1935 by Ben Sean. And the caption is, Minor walking atop slag heap. And it's kind of a classical image of a coal camp with uh, the air problems, you know, that existed there and the, and the fairly um, low level of housing. Um, ben Sean and Walker Evans were friends and shared a studio in New York. And they had uh, an art show together. In, and at that point, Ben Sean was already an artist. They had an art show t together on Cape Cod where Ben Sean had a, a summer home. And um, Ben Sean actually was not hired for the FSA project. He was hired to do graphic arts. But he hadn't had a lot of experience touring the country. And so he was sent off for a couple of months to go see the country. And he came through West Virginia and into the Deep South and took some extraordinary photographs. Uh, Roy Stryker you know, recognized that and grandfathered them and also. Um, in Walker Evans and Ben Chong were a tremendous influence on the development of the FSA project because they were so well grounded in the arts. They were already part of sort of high culture in New York. And they were, uh, had long talks with Roy Stryker about setting very high standards for the photography. This photograph was taken in Cables in McDowell County in uh, September 1938 by Marion Post Walcott. Uh, the caption is, minor waiting for a ride home. Each minor pays 25 cents a week to the owner of a car. And uh, if I can get this to work, the laser. Anyway, what you'll notice, if you notice on his right boot, his toe is sticking out. On his left knee, um, he's got safety pins keeping his pants together. I think it's just a tragic photograph that he was obviously a hardworking miner and couldn't even, you know, wear the protective clothing that he needed. And uh, this is a photograph uh, that was taken in Marine in McDowell County in September 38, also by Marion Post Walcott. And the caption is, wife of unemployed coal miner suffering from TB, living in old company store in abandoned mining town. And I really, the first photo of the kids on the bed and this one, I really struggled with whether to put these in the book. but. Two things happened. One, I really tried to get into the photograph and why it was taken, and the, and the, and this especially how the spirit of the woman shows through, and also they're very highly publicized photos. And there's a website called um, Shorpy that has a lot of uh, New Deal photographs, and this is featured prominently on that website. And I thought it wouldn't be right to leave it out. So these are, um, these are the problem photographs, and there are more. But I wanted to share this with you as a sort of context for showing the more positive photographs. Um, the second purpose of the program project was to show solutions. And at, in the beginning, these solutions were primarily tied to the uh, subsistence homestead communities. Arthur Dale in uh, Preston County was the first of those communities in the country. Eleanor Roosevelt was very, very closely tied in with that project. She was on the, helped initiate it. She was on the advisory council. She picked out the refrigerators. She fought for plumbing because there was a feeling like, well, these people don't need plumbing. And she was like, yes, they do. Um, there were a lot of problems with the project. 
Um, it, it turned out to be very expensive as a prototype, and uh, she got blamed for it. <laughs> and I think that actually was one of the impetus, part of the impetus for developing the project because uh, the person who ended up with responsibility for all of the subsistence homestead projects was Rexford Tugwell. And uh, he, uh, he was the person who had worked with Roy Stryker and hired him. Um, even before the project started, Eleanor Roosevelt sponsored an exhibit in Washington, D.C. in April of 1934 to show photographs of, of Arthur Dale um, in the beginning of the development. And it, it was, uh, as far as I can tell, it was a one day, it might have gone longer, but there was one day of the exhibit where the president was there and she was there. They made what was described as the first joint radio presentation by a, a president and first lady, invited the cabinet and the Congress to come. Um, the main photographer early on would have been Elmer Johnson. And John, we don't know a lot about him, but uh, he was already working for the federal government. And he took this photograph in Arthur Dale in May of 1934, which was after that exhibit. And it was uh, captioned as House Under Construction. Uh, people were chosen from Scott's Run. They went through a selection process and they were selected to live in the Arthur Dale project. Um, there, were, there were criteria and there was a, a kind of scientific uh, selection process, but it was only open to white native born families because of a concern that uh, ethnic groups or um, minorities would not fit into the Preston County community. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt didn't agree with that decision, but um, that was the way that it went. She actually ended up going back to, to D.C. She was driving herself over here at one point. <laughs> didn't have Secret Service, drove her own car. Um, came over with groups, sometimes came by train. And even when she would go to Arthurdale, uh, she would also go to Scott's Run, and she kept invested in that community and, and continued to work with people there. Um, but, but at one point she went back to D.C. and convened a meeting of civil rights leaders. And uh, the president ended up sitting in. One of the leaders was, had been in Charleston. He was, uh, worked at the First Baptist Church, and Mordecai Johnson, and was... Uh, President, of, I think of Howard, I can't remember right now, it's in the book, but um, in some ways she was given credit for contributing to uh, a revitalization of the civil rights movement. This image was also taken by Johnson, this time in September 1935, and uh, it shows women preparing, women volunteers preparing school lunch. There was a high um, level of civic engagement that was part of the project, of all three projects. This photograph was taken in Eleanor in September of 1935, also by Elmer Johnson, and it showed children leaving school. I love this picture because the kids are so exuberant. And then this part, this is a photograph which was selected for the back of the book, was taken in Eleanor in 1937 by Ben Sean. Um, it was captioned, Washing a Prize Bull at the Dairy Barn. The projects tried to combine um, some agriculture, agricultural component and some subsistence farming and lead toward the families buying their own homes. Um, this photograph was taken at, Tiger at the Tiger Valley Project in August 1936 by Carl Mydens, and um, it was called Threshing. And I, uh, Carl Mydens is one of the photographers who had been working in another part of the federal government 
came in with the project with Roy Stryker. But he left. He took. He only lasted with the project for a year because uh, Life magazine started in the fall of 1930. Uh, I think 1936, and he actually went over to Life magazine at the time of the first issue. And he had a fascinating life. He he worked there, met his wife there. Um, they were sent to China and interned by the Japanese and were in an internment camp in the Philippines. Um, they were released after a, about a year and a half, and then he actually went back, and there's a famous photograph of MacArthur landing on the Philippines. He was in the photography pool and was chosen to be the photographer for that event, so he actually took that picture. Uh, he, he was a great writer, and um, wrote a, a really good book about his life, and and he also interviewed really well. And in one of the oral histories, he he commented about how, um, looking back after World War II, that the country had been fragmented. Um, people didn't know a lot about each other, and he thought that this photography project really helped prepare the way for a success in World War II because it brought people together and allowed them to know each other and see themselves as part of the country as a whole. Mine also took this picture um, at Tiger Valley. It's captioned, uh, Homesteader Carrying Products Woven at Tiger Valley Project. And uh, there were attempts to involve women in different, men and women in different crafts, and weaving was one of them. And some of the men were involved in furniture making and metal work. This was uh, taken by John Vachon in June 1939. All of the rest of the series were taken at Tiger Valley because for some reason it just really brought out the best in the photographers. From my point of view, I thought they just took great photographs. Uh, it was captioned, Homesteader Returning from Work in the Lumber Plant. Um, John Fashon is another person I haven't mentioned, but he came to the project just kind of looking for a job. He was an English major and started working with the files and got very excited about the photography and Roy Stryker sent him out with the camera. And, and he had a real feeling for West Virginia. He, 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 the things he wrote showed how much he uh, appreciated the culture here. And some of the things were harsh but also very insightful in a good way, I think. Uh, this is another photograph that he took in June 1939 called View of Tiger Valley Project. Last year I gave a presentation like this at uh, Heritage Village in Morgantown, and one of the women there grew up in the brown house. It was really great. And there was another woman who was, whose uh, property was taken for, for Tiger Valley. Her family didn't qualify. Her father was uh, an educator, and they moved up the road. And she wasn't begrudging that. I mean, she believed in the project, I think, in what she said. A, a lot of these homes are still there. They're lived in. They've been added on to um, in all three communities. Uh, this was uh, taken by Arthur Rothstein in December 1941. Arthur Rothstein was one of the first photographers hired for the project. He had already worked with Roy Stryker at, uh, at Columbia University and became a mainstay of the program. And at this point, he was trying to find his proper place in the military. Um, and actually went to work for Look Magazine and then came back and worked for the project, and then eventually was uh, inducted as a photographer in the military. The caption is Dr. Tabor entering health center to give inoculations against measles to a group of children. Um, one of the things that I could not track down is whether this was taken before or after Pearl Harbor. It just says December 1941, so. It would be nice to know that, but um, the pictures stand on their own. 
And this is one of my favorites of all of the pictures, uh, also taken by Arthur Rostina in December 1941. And it's called Singing Games in the Schoolyard Homestead School. And the Homestead School is still a, a thriving school. I think the upstairs maybe has some problems and they're using the downstairs, but that was as of a year or two ago, so I'm not sure what the situation is right now. So I want to go on and show uh, a larger sample of photographs of every, everyday life because that became really um, a hallmark of the photographs. Uh, Roy Stryker would give assignments, he would make shooting scripts, but they were somewhat loosely interpreted the photographers were trusted to make good photographs and really use their judgment about what they saw. Um, and in the beginning, the focus was on small town and rural life because there was a feeling that people in the cities who uh, had a lot of role in decision making and voting for policies um, didn't really understand what was going on in, in the rural and small town parts of the country. But at, toward the end, and especially during World War II, they focused also on cities. And at, at one point, there's this poignant letter from Roy Stryker to uh, Dorothea Lange, who was based in, she took the famous picture of Margaret uh, Mother and also a lot of Dust Bowl images. And she was based in San Francisco and Berkeley. Um, and, and he wrote her and said, um, I'm sure you can find poverty in Los Angeles. Go look for it. <laughs> uh, this photograph was taken in, in Buchanan in September 1938 by Marion Post Walcott, and it was captioned Old Private House, Now Tourist Home. Um, it's still there. It's a B&B, &B, one of the first B&Bs in the state. I was there last year, and um, it's really great. I, I hadn't really connected it with, I knew the person, the proprietor, but I hadn't really connected this picture with her home. So it was very exciting to me to be able to visit and see it. This is uh, a photograph by Walker Evans, taken in Morgantown in June 1935, called View of Town. Um, the view is still there from the Barbers at the Pleasant Street Bridge. I always get mixed up. The Western Bridge? No, the Pleasant. The Pleasant Street where you go up by the City Hall and across that canyon. Oh. Dunker Creek. Would be the South Park Bridge. Yeah, yeah. That, the Walnut Street Bridge. That's what oh, I get Pleasant mixed up. Street, one is the South. Well, Walnut. It's Walnut Street Bridge. Okay, thanks. So. Um, Mark Crabtree tried, had a photographer come out from California who was following Walker Evans' footsteps also, tried to replicate this from the bridge and was like, <laughs> you know, hanging off the edge trying to get the same angle because, of course, you know, some things have changed. But the view is essentially the same and the houses are still there. Um, this is a street scene in clay in, uh, October 1935, taken by Ben Sean. And if you look really closely, um, reflected in the glass on the right, you can see a man standing with a camera pointing ahead. Ben Sean had, and Walker Evans both had a right angle view cam, uh, a right angle lens. They could be looking over here and photograph you over here. And uh, they didn't do it all the time, but they did it some of the time. And, this, and they got caught in some of the reflections. <laughs> There's also one of uh, Walker Evans doing that. And I've actually seen and held the um, lens they used. Uh, this photograph was taken in Elkins in uh, June 1939 by John Vachon and called The Shady Side of Main Street. This uh, was taken by a Marion Post Walcott in September 38 in Morgantown. It was captioned, Farm Women Come to Town on Saturday Afternoon 
to sell eggs, milk, cakes, etc. in the courthouse square. It still looks like that. Excuse me. This was uh, taken by Marion Post Walcott in September 38. Manview in, in Irwin, which I think is in Randolph County. Um, man viewed from top of sawmill ramp. And I, can you picture her with her camera at the top of that ramp? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing to me. It's just a great photograph, artistically. Some of you may recognize this. It's Union Carbide in South Charleston. September 38 by Marion Post Walcott. Lunch hour, part of Union Carbide Country uh, Company. Uh, this was taken by Ben Sean in October of 35 in Scott's Run, called Sunday. And I included this photograph and a couple of the others because they really show, um, it reflects people's memories of how people used to dress when they went to town. And it really documents that. This photograph was taken by Marion Post Walcott in Maidsville in September 1938. It was captioned the next trip, coal miners ready for next shift to go into the mines. Um, this is a photograph Randy is making famous for us by <laughs> um, actually researching who owned the motorcycle. It was taken in Omar in uh, Logan County in October 1935 by Ben Sean and called Main Street. And if you go to, uh, through Omar now, it's very hard to recognize. One of the houses on the left, which those were the bosses' houses, is still there. Um, there's a church uh, on this side that's been moved down and across the road. There's still a very small remnant of a railroad trestle, and and some of the uh, some of the coal camp houses are still there. The thing about Omar is that it defies our images of coal camps. It was a company headquarters. It was landscaped. Um, there was a four or five store um, company store that had custom made suits and furniture and pharmaceuticals and uh, food. I mean, it was just like an all purpose store, um, very high end. Somewhere I read that the coal company may have made more from its company stores than they did from coal mining. I, don't, I haven't seen documentation of that. But Omar was really a, a, a very uh, elegant, it was still paternalistic, it had the qualities of coal camps that, that we read about, but also had a lot of advanced elements to it. It was also segregated in the 30s. Um, ben Sean took this photograph in October 1935, and it was entitled Negroes school children, and uh, there was uh, a school, uh, African-American school down the road, down the street from the white school. Uh, this was also taken in Omar by Ben Sean in October of 35, captioned men sitting on club by the miners, on curb by the miners clubhouse. And he later um, left photography behind, went back to painting and printmaking, and made a painting of this photograph that ended up in a museum in Japan, and also in, in at least one book that I've seen. Uh, some of the people I talked to in Omar had uh, very mixed memories about the times, some of the people who remembered the times, and especially segregation. And uh, a couple of people said that the, the two miners on the right could not have been African American because they wouldn't all be hanging out together. And other people said, we used to all play together. Our, our, our communities were integrated. We didn't even know, you know, um, after school. So I, I, one of the things I discovered in doing uh, research for some of the early exhibits, and the first exhibit I did was in Omar, is that the photographs can evoke some very deep memories that people have and really cause uh, some reflection and discussion. 
this is uh, this. The caption for this photograph is uh, minor parentheses Russian, taken in Cables in McDowell County in September 1938 by Marion Post Walcott. And this was the company store in uh, Cables, taken at the same time. And uh, this was payday in Stirrett, which is right down the road from Omar. Um, you might notice the little car with the Maytag sign on it. And it was explained to me that people would buy appliances on time, and then um, the company would come collect on payday. So the final part of the section of photography involves the photographs that were taken on the home front during World War II. And they have more of a photojournalistic style. There was a different mission. Uh, to really help build people's spirits. And Life and Look magazines were already well established. There was a lot of back and forth in terms of personnel with the FSA project. John Collier was junior, um, was hired sort of late in the project. And he came to Richwood, to Nicholas County in September 1942 to document a project where Local residents were recruited to go to Batavia, New York, and pick apples. And there's a great, uh, and he shows all the phases of that project. And there's uh, a great article of Golden Seal that I think was written in 1989 about this um, series, and says that at the same time, West Virginia also needed people to pick apples, but, um, but people from here were recruited to go to New York. This, uh, this scene in Richwood is still there. Um, it's really pretty amazing. It, it could, to me it's very uh, European looking. Um, very beautiful. Uh, this photograph was taken also in Richwood. Um, it was labeled a family talking over the prospects of work with the US Employment Service. And this is another photograph in that series, um, children preparing to deliver newspapers. And one of the things I love about this photograph is the little, the little girl on the left. And, and I think it's because I may, may have looked a little bit like that um, at her age. But also because when I was growing up in the early 50s, late 40s and early 50s, girls weren't allowed to deliver newspapers. And I, I thought it was really cool that um, there was a time even before that when they were. I ended up with a paper route after I retired from DHHR. It was very hard. <laughs> very hard work. Uh, the last two photographs were taken in Point Pleasant in May 1943 by Arthur Siegel. Um, Arthur Siegel was uh, Grew up in Detroit and um, did a lot of freelance work. Uh, he taught at Wayne State University and had had already uh, established himself and done some contract work for the FSA, and then was hired for a year by the office of by the same project for the Office of War and Information. Uh, this was labeled LT boats being built for the U.S. Army at the Marietta Manufacturing Company, which was based in Point Pleasant. And it's an amazing bit of West Virginia history, and I'm doing an article on it right now for Golden Seal. It's just fascinating. Uh, I was trying to figure out where Arthur Siegel was before he went there. Right before he went there, he took over 900 photographs at a shipyard in Baltimore. And I'm also working on a book about, of those photographs. He's a, he was an amazing photographer and did an amazing body of work. At one point in the 60s, Encyclopedia Britannica said he was one of the great American photographers. And then after a while, he, kind of, he passed away in the late 70s, and, and I don't think got the recognition, 
recognition that he deserved. It's, I've met his family and uh, had an, an exhibit of his work in Point Pleasant, and I'm invested in working some more with his photographs. And I've also been talking with people who worked in the plant um, in the 60s, not in the 40s, but had long memories about it. And uh, this was also taken as part of that series. Um, it showed Mrs. Ferguson and a neighbor discussing a homemade dress. This was a new housing project in Point Pleasant. Uh, Mrs. Ferguson's husband was a school principal. And um, he basically followed, he was brought into their family and allowed to take a lot of pictures in the family. And I think what really, um, when I talk about positive images of the state, this epitomizes that because it's just such a, um, it's so contrary to some of the images we see sometimes of the state. And, and just as um, a little bit more context, the driving forces behind the FSA project were Rexford Tugwell, who I mentioned. He, became, he was at Columbia teaching economics, uh, ended up bringing Roy Stryker in. They did a book together where they used photographs by Lewis Hine, who had also photographed in West Virginia um, prior to that, and then later on in the 30s. And, uh, Roy Stryker was the director of this whole project through the whole life of the project. Eleanor Roosevelt was a key player um, because of her, starting with her involvement with Scott's Run and Arthur Dale. And the president was a huge supporter. And, and Roy Stryker always felt that he had the ear of the president, either directly or through Rexford Tugwell. And that was uh, a great help in protecting the value of the project as it went over the years. And I also want to note the role of Pierre Lorenz, who is from West Virginia and who was in Washington at the same time working on films within the same, also worked with Rexford Tugwell and with the president and um, did some amazing films. The first one was the, the now I'm forgetting it. The, the plow that, um, what is it? Broke the planes. The plow that broke the planes and the river, which are both on YouTube, and they're well worth seeing. The river won the uh, 1938 documentary prize at the Venice International Film Festival. Um, Pierre Lorenz became director of a U.S. film office for a couple of years, and uh, was just uh, an amazing, visionary about uh, the role of film and also worked closely with Roy Stryker and some of his some of his photographers and he kept he kept close to his roots in West Virginia. Um, and then I mentioned the historical context a little bit. Um, there were divisions in the country going back to the Civil War, um, regionalism, and then another big factor that the photography project um, was inspired to address was uh, communism and the rise of Hitler and the Axis powers internationally. Um, some of the photographers had been in Europe and seen the effects of Hitler directly in the early 30s, mid 30s. And uh, from what I've read about President Roosevelt, he was very aware of the threats from the time that he entered office or even earlier. So there was a consciousness of wanting to bring the country together, build the spirit of the country, and the photographers were very invested in that vision. I want to conclude by talking about the legacy and where we are now and going forward. I. Um, there's sort of three aspects to this that I want to mention. One is that uh, the, the photographs allow us to reframe the documentation of our state's history, 
to reflect positive memories. And I, I was interviewed for public radio and I mentioned that there are some books that I've picked up and cringed <laughs> when I saw the negative images of the state. And one of the most gratifying parts of this project for me are when people have picked this book up and thanked me and felt like it, it seems to help to connect and heal with the positive memories. Um, second, it, the photographs demonstrate and contribute to the rich artistic culture of the state, and there are a lot of different um, initiatives that have promoted that and are still. And one of the people I want to recognize is John Cuthbert, who works at the West Virginia State and Regional Collection at WVU Library. He did an, a book about 20 years ago called Early Art arts and artists in West Virginia, and I highly recommend that. Um, there's a copy here. Um, because he talks about the artists, he, he normalizes the arts, the visual arts in West Virginia, and talks about the artists from West Virginia who became very well recognized, and the artists who came to West Virginia to um, use the terrain as inspiration for their art. And he also talks about some of these photographers. Uh, Arthur Rothstein did a book later in life called, about documentary photography, and three of the pioneers he mentioned were related to West Virginia. One was Francis Benjamin Johnston, who was born around the Civil War in Grafton, ended up in D.C., and uh, just did an amazing body of work. Um, second was Matthew Brady and his staff, who photographed during the Civil War. And third was Louis Wittstein, who photographed here in the 1900s um, and then came back in the 1920s to look at child labor. And also came back in 1936 for the WPA, photographed at Scotts Run and other parts of the state. I mentioned Pierre Lorenz. Um, some of the modern initiatives are the Vandalia Gathering, uh, Mountain Stage, Larry's here, uh, the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame, uh, which has just been so amazing to look at um, musicians of all genres from West Virginia. Uh, I'm, I'm a great fan of The Hollow Project by Lane McMillian, who uh, recently did a multidisciplinary um, work based in McDowell County where she <coughs> gave people the chance to speak in their own voice about their vision for the future. She's been getting international awards and has been recognized, her film's being shown all over the world. And it's really cutting edge um, technique in terms of using the web and, and an interactive um, approach, which I don't even understand because I don't have the equipment to do it. But if you look up the Hollow Project, it's really great. And then there's a comparable range in diversity in the state in terms of architecture, dance, film, literature, theater, and the visual arts. And third, um, part of the legacy is to inspire current and future artists in all media. The FSA photos are in books, as you can see. Uh, some of those are fairly modern in museums and galleries. They're online through the Library of Congress and other websites. I mentioned about the high-res scans. The Library of Congress is currently rescanning all of their photographs to make them even more available to people to print out. And from my perspective as a fine art landscape photographer, the bottom line in terms of our current and future work is what is to be included in the photograph for other work of art. And think about things like, um, I had I, I flew to L.A. for Christmas. I hadn't flown for a long time, and I was at the gift shop at the Yeager Airport, and there was a postcard with something like Great Houses of West Virginia, and there were six outhouses. You know, why do we have that? <laughs> I mean, um, there's, there are great houses in West Virginia all over the state in all different sizes and income levels. And I, when I saw the title, I thought, well, maybe that's what it is. So we have a lot of choices. 
And, and even then, um, when I think about Marion Post Walcott and that first picture I showed of the kids on the bed, the houses in the East End were here then. She didn't choose to photograph them. She, she did get permission after she was here to go to Florida and photograph rich people. And she did the same in, in Warrington, Virginia. Um, because she thought that that was something that was important to include in the project file. But we have, um, we have a wonderful, rich, positive history. We don't have a lot of images that reflect that. And so this is my contribution to the crusade to kind of move that forward. And, and I was going to say, it's really hard. I've gone down and retraced Marion um, Post Walcott's steps in McDowell County. I'm not that interested in brand new houses. They're not that visually interesting in photographs. So I, I can see you know, why those images didn't make it into the portfolios. But it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. In conclusion, um, I just thought I'd give some, just some thoughts about things we can do. And I think the first is self-awareness about how the different negative images have affected our lives. Um, second is to uh, question the negatives and support the positives, like I, I will get with the people at Jaeger at some point. Um, and it's their right to have those photographs. I just wish they had more positive ones. Um, and I have a, there is a photographer who does great West Virginia postcards. Um, at the same time, being realistic about the poverty and the other problems we need to address, because we all know we have this, and it's not a matter of setting those aside. Someone wrote a review on Amazon where he said, I was from West Virginia and I left, and I think this book is whitewashing because it doesn't have enough images of poverty. You know, <laughs> I mean, that was his perspective, but I didn't agree with it. Uh, we can support and or participate in the arts, also other local businesses, agriculture, tourism, preservation, etc. in terms of the decisions we make about, you know, where do we buy our gifts. I, I produce an art show, art fair, so I'm very invested in um, the quality of the arts in West Virginia and the, and the arts and crafts. And finally, I just want to say, I think I really think that we're on the cusp of a transition in our economy as a state, and I think part of it's generational. And I think um, it's important to promote and engage in open and inclusive conversations about major issues and decisions at every level, um, basically get real and work towards solutions. I went to a couple very great conferences this year, or this last year, um, spearheaded by young people, some of them in the state or from the state and living elsewhere. And at one conference, um, the organizer said, I was told not to address climate change because if I do, nobody will have, you know, this conference won't happen. That's really sad. <laughs> um, if we don't really tackle these hard issues, other people are going to make decisions for us, and I don't think I think we've had a lot of that, and that hasn't necessarily always worked out well. I didn't um, I didn't mention, but part of how I got into this whole project was by reading a passage in a book by Dr. Ronald Lewis from WVU, where he said that, and he was quoting research from someone else that I haven't looked at myself. But he said that part of how we got such a bad rap was that in the late 1800s, sort of yellow dog journalists came in from the Northeast and actually created backwoods images to sell books and to justify some of the exploitation that was going on in Appalachia. And uh, I guess it really motivated me <laughs> to, um, you know, try to counteract that, and so I'm on a, kind of a crusade on that issue. And there are other people, I, I'm very honored to join the other people that are doing that. Father O'Donnell's here, and he's done some wonderful projects based in, uh, at Wheeling Jesuit University, 
showing also photographs from the 40s, um, comparing healthcare issues with uh, a more modern take on the issues. And they've traveled to Harvard. I mean, th you all did a great the, the breadth of the project and the, I guess, how, how majestic some of these projects could actually be that, that Eleanor uh, Roosevelt was involved in. When you look at Eleanor, uh, we have uh, in, our, in our collections, we have some of the panoramics of Eleanor as it was being built. And those, those pictures really, really show a, a, the, majestic, the majestic side of that whole project. Anyone else? Thank you all for, oh, Brian? I was just wondering, uh, among the many photographs taken by the people who work at the FSA, did some of them just linger on the landscape, or was it always pretty much open to people? That's a really good question. Did the photographs just linger, did they ever linger on the landscape of mainly focus on people and situations. Um, most of the shooting scripts were geared toward people yeah. and their activities. However, Marion post there, there was a sort of inside joke about, I can't remember the exact language, but something to effect of, you know, maple syrup photos or really super sweet photos. And Marion post Walcott was sort of the poster child of that because she took these beautiful landscapes in Vermont, Virginia, and a couple in West Virginia. Um, but that was the exception. Larry? How did they choose where they went? Oh, that's a really good question. How did they choose where they went? It was uh, a mix of factors. Um, they had, a, the, when they first started out in the uh, resettlement administration, they had field offices. So um, they would get requests from field offices to send photographers. And that um, was a factor because they would have a support structure and they would have to have someone to show them around. But it was also um, a mixed bag because sometimes the people would uh, have interests that were really not at the level that they were trying to set for the FSA project or the, the RA project. Um, the, some of the photographers would stay out for, for months and months, and, and they would get some direction from Roy Stryker, and there was, there's wonderful correspondence in the archives in Louisville, University of Louisville, where, where he would talk about what he wanted them to look at and where they needed to go. Um, and then sometimes they would stumble into things, and he would support them in doing that. Uh, during the war, it got a lot more difficult because of rationing of gas and tires. There, were, there was correspondence back and forth about trying to get tires. And then um, honoring you know, wartime security and, and who would let you into the plant or wherever they were. So there, there were really a lot of different factors. But, but there was a, an overriding um, consideration they weren't expected to show all parts of every state, but they were expected. <clears throat> Roy Stryker wanted the file to show all aspects of life in the country as a whole, of American life. And so he would say, you know, we, we and, and he got almost, this is on YouTube, and somebody may question this some scholar if they ever see it. But he, he almost got obsessive. Some of the photographers in their interviews in the 60s said, you know, we're not really sure he knew what he had toward the end <laughs> because he was getting so much wonderful work uh, and already had so much. I mean, we're talking about 150,000 images. And he, and he, got, he got the film. Um, there was still the issue of having certain ones printed. Um, but he was still sending out letters saying, um, I, I really want to know what the corn harvest looks like in Nebraska. And I want to know about the, the granary and all of the, you know, all the different aspects of it. 
so it was, it was uh, a really, a, really a combination of factors that sort of had a life of its own. Very early on, um, there was uh, a writer named Staunton Lynn who wrote a book about uh, small towns in America. I can't remember the exact title. And he met with Roy Stryker and talked to him about these are the kinds of things we really need people to, to look at and understand. <clears throat> and I, I included a very generic shooting script, I think, or some excerpts of it in the book. But, but there were... Um, there was a real interest in depicting um, regular, ordinary life in small towns because, think about it, the, what were the main ways that we knew about each other? Um, photography was still young. I mean, it was born in the mid-1800s, but, and, and it was very widespread. There were a lot of photographers in West Virginia. But in terms of photographing, documentary style photography, this was really in the early stages. And the 35 millimeter camera had just come out in the, I think in the, maybe in the 20s. So it was really, a, gave them a lot more flexibility to go out and film. But, but think about how we knew about things. The, there were photographs in newspapers, 80% of the newspapers from one assessment I read did not support the president. So they didn't necessarily print the kinds of photographs that would document the needs for what he was doing or the successes. There were photographs from this project in the New York Times, some of them from some of these photographers. But there were the Hearst chain, there were a lot of um, newspapers where people might not have seen them. <clears throat> and, and they didn't have a, uh, photography staffs to go out and take the photographs. Um, Part of Stryker's mission was to provide free photographs to whoever would print them. And they also did exhibits. They were, at, I think, at the exposition in San Francisco and did, contributed to books, helped, helped develop books. Uh, but there, was, there were movies and uh, newsreels, and they were somewhat controlled. Um, and there was radio. And there's a whole body of work about how FDR used radio to reach directly to people um, because he didn't have access to them in other ways. So this really, f it was very visionary as a way to fill the void and get the word out. There's a wonderful book that I have over here by uh, Nathanson about the African American images in the, in the FSA project. And he said that West Virginia was one of a few states that had a higher proportion of photographs of African Americans than, their, than they were part of the population. So there were a lot of photographs that I didn't include just because I could only include so many and I was trying to tell a, a total story. In terms of the actual ethnic groups, um, they weren't represented in the model communities, and that was one of the focal points of the photography, so that automatically excluded them. In, um, the book has a photograph of a Mexican minor and child, and uh, 
Mary Post Walcott did a whole series on Mexican miners in Scott's Run. And she was, she was probably more aware and more focused. She also did the photograph of the Russian miner and had another one of uh, an Eastern European miner, that I, Polish miner from Cables that, um, that I didn't include. Uh, I, my sense is that it, they, they were just trying to wrap their arms around such a big project that that was not a major focus. That's just my sense of it. But I, but I have to tell you there's a story and it's in a book that's over my shoulder in the library here. The, <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was another sort of sister project called the WPA Writer's Guides where writers were um, hired to document life or actually almost like tourist guides in every state. And the people who were hired, and the person who headed that project in West Virginia um, was not in favor with the governor. And he fought him at every turn. And, and uh, there's some documentation in the archives here about that. And I quoted a little bit in the book that Jerry Thomas had tracked down. He had done an article that's actually on the archives website. And there were three photographs that, um, that he really rejected. And one of them was the Mexican mine. And then the reason he rejected it was because he said West Virginia was Anglo-American state, and there was that that photograph didn't fit. There, one of the other photographs was uh, a miner. It's in the book. Miner um, taking bath in a wash tub. He rejected that because he says it looks like we don't have plumbing in West Virginia. And of course, wash tubs were. Huge feature of life in the 30s. And uh, the third one was taken by Ben Sean and Eleanor, and it showed, in a, it's actually, I have a, a West Virginia history journal, the most recent one here, and it's actually on the cover. Um, I have it here because they reviewed the book and I wanted to share that, but um, it shows some children uh, in a kind of like a pickup truck with sides that you would haul stock in, um, getting off to go to school in Eleanor. And uh, it's a wonderful photograph. And the governor said that it made it look like, you know, that we didn't have school buses. I don't think those kinds of comments affected how the project was shaped. I think it was more just trying to do as much as they could with what they had. One uh, quick point about the gentleman when he asked about the ethnic uh, photographs. Uh, Russ Barber, when he was doing the Winding Gulf documentary for PBS, uncovered uh, some home movies by the Lucini family. Uh, lived not too far from where Senator Byrd went to uh, high school at uh, Mark Twain High School. And they were some, some boys, I mean some teenage boys, and they got together and they bought a movie camera, and they shot the things boys would shoot, like uh, using uh, boards to skate down slag piles, or to, to like ski down slag piles, and crazy stuff. And they shot it. They were just a little hard to transfer because they didn't have a lot of money for film. So <laughs> they got really conserved film because there's a lot of very brief scenes. But in that, if you want to see it, if you look at the Pete West Virginia Public Broadcasting's documentary on the Winding Gulf, you'll see some of that footage. You'll see him like uh, filling bags up uh, with sand, and there's the block steam off, and make a swim, swimming pool. <laughs> Just crazy stuff. I mean, you know, that only, you know, had to, I mean, I can sort of relate it to today's YouTube, some of the kids, what they do, but they, they did it, they, except they had to send it off and wait for it to come back see how it turned out, but some of that footage, and it was all pretty positive. I mean, they, they must have worked pretty hard to get the money for that camera and, and worked harder to get the film money. Uh, but it's, it's an unusual thing. And when you said that, it made me think of it. Hey, sorry. To, wonderful program, by the way. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Well, I, uh, encourage you to 
look through the book or look at some of the other documents or go back out in the cold and be safe. And thank you very much for coming.